Hello friends, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all our viewers who have joined from different parts of the world and, and a special welcome to our plenary speaker Beth who is up awake at I think it's about 2 o'clock at night from where she is, uh, where she is stationed. So welcome to the tenth session of APCR SHR 10 virtual, the ongoing virtual series of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. Co-hosted by APCR SHR 10, Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia and CNS, this virtual conference features 14 online thematic sessions spread over June to December 2020 with plenary speakers and top ranking abstract presenters sharing their insights around sexual and reproductive health and rights and sustainable development goals in the Asia Pacific regional context. These sessions are also streamed live on the Facebook pages of APCR SHR 10 and CNS. Today's session is on innovations and changing norms around SRHR in Asia Pacific. Just a few housekeeping announcements for our viewers before I hand over the mic to our chairperson for today. My humble request to all the presenters to please adhere to your allotted time. There will be a prompt from the chairperson two minutes before your scheduled time is over. Audience, please keep yourself muted and your videos turned off throughout the session. Presenters are also requested to mute themselves when not speaking. There will be a question and answer session after all the speakers have presented. Those who are using Zoom platform can type in their comments and questions in the chat box. You can do so even as speakers present and not wait till the end. If you are watching it on Facebook Live, you can type in your question in the comment box. In the interest of time, please keep your questions and comments brief and precise. Also, we are living in challenging times and most of us are working from home. So please bear with each other in case of any technical glitches arising out of poor internet connectivity. In fact, right now, I am working from a region. We, I don't have any electricity power in the house and my internet connection is also very poor. So I may have to switch off my video in between uh, if the bandwidth uh, is, uh, is not very good. I now hand over the mic to our chairperson, Dr. Eden Divina Gracia, Executive Director of Philippines NGO Council on Population Health and Welfare, or more commonly known as PNGOC. It is a national network of NGOs involved in promoting human rights for vulnerable groups, especially health rights and justice for all. Eden has been actively involved in the organization and planning of APCR SHR since its inception. In fact, she led the organizing of the first conference in 2001 in Philippines and then again the seventh one in 2014. So we are indeed very, very honored to have her with us today. Through years of her leadership, she is known for her expertise in family planning, HIV AIDS, maternal, child and newborn health, and sexual and reproductive health. So she wears too many crowns at the same time. And I'm also grateful for her for being here today, despite the typhoon winter that has been raging her country since yesterday. So over to you, Aiden. Okay. So thank you very much, Shoba, and uh, welcome. And we are really honored that you're now participating in this very uh, important session. And uh, of course, we are very proud to, uh, to present to you all our speakers. And uh, they will be giving you all the updates and whatever innovations and changes are going on in their respective programs. In as much as we are in a different environment, or what you call, but there's one thing in common among all of us, the global pandemic. Okay, so anyway, I will, without much ado, I would like to introduce to you uh, Beth Schlachter, and we're all, and we're very much honored that she is with us now. 
she will she is our plenary speaker who will be talking about um, family planning programs to date and collective vision for family planning post 2020. So Beth, she's beautiful, right? And Beth, sorry that you have really to to be awake this time in your country. So Beth is, as you know, is the executive director of Family Planning 2020 or EPI 2020. This is a global community of partners working together to ensure women and girls are empowered to decide freely and for themselves whether, when, and how many children to have. Beth provides strategic leadership to EPI 2020, which brings together partner countries, donor governments, civil society organizations, multilateral institutions, foundations, and private sector partners. And of course, everything, all the programs are really rights-based. Beth was a foreign affairs officer of the US government, serving in positions including senior population policy advisor, overseeing the US priorities in multilateral organizations and negotiations related to sexual and reproductive health and rights. So my dear colleagues, I now present to you no other than our beautiful plenary speaker, Beth Shackler. Okay, Beth. Thank you so much, Dr. Aiden. I think that's the nicest introduction I've ever had. So <laughs> it's so early in the morning, it cheers me up. So thank you so much. And I've, it's such a warm welcome to work with all of you. The colleagues in this region have been the heart of FP 2020 since it was launched. So I really want to thank the International Steering Committee of the Asia Pacific Conference on Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights and the Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia, as well as Citizen News. And just to congratulate you for the pivot that you did when we had to cancel the very much anticipated in-person meeting, but to hold these series of discussions that have been so successful and have kept our conversation going throughout the pandemic is really an achievement. So thank you for your hard work and again, for your warm welcome. If I could please have a first slide, please. So Dr. Aiden just did a wonderful job of introducing FP 2020. So I don't think I need to, to share that. Um, but in the slides, when they come up, I just wanted to bring people up to date on where we were with family planning progress as of July of last year. Every year, as many of you know, FP 2020 publishes an annual report which shares an update on contraceptive use. And we will be launching our next annual report in January of 2021. We've delayed it a bit so that countries have a chance to do their annual assessments of their progress. And that's been a bit behind this year because of COVID. So we'll launch our annual report in January of 2021. You can go forward two slides, please. Um, and so many of you will recognize that this last, last data that we had published, one more please, uh, showed that as of July 2019, there were 53 million additional women and girls who were using modern contraceptives across the 69 focus countries for the FP2020 partnership. But the majority of that growth actually took place in the Asia Pacific region with nearly 30 million additional users over that eight year period coming from Asia. So my congratulations to the region for the growth of your family planning programs. Next slide, please. But the partnership has done more than add contraceptive users. Um, it's done a lot for the, to transform the family planning community as a whole. And when the partnership was launched in 2012, six of the countries, there were 24 at that point, who made commitments uh, to FP 2020 came from the Asia region. They were Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Solomon Islands, Philippines, and Indonesia. And now there are 13 countries from the region. So the growth is tremendous. And we really congratulate you on the work because we've seen commitments that are with collaboration with civil society, importantly with young people, many of whom I see on the, on the call today, including young people from the Africa region who are here with us today to learn about Asia partners. There are also partners from the private sector, from manufacturers, and from healthcare providers themselves. Next slide, please. 
But we all know that in facing the COVID pandemic, that um, there are priorities within the Asia region as well that have shown how you can successfully continue to make progress, even as there are delays in service com in commodity delivery, in service availability, restrictions on movement for people. But importantly, the region is trying to find innovations, and I know we'll be hearing from many partners today about this as well, to ensure that access to a full range of contraceptives continues for women and girls, even as we face these um, critical shutdowns across the globe. Next slide, please. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is how the partnership for FP2020 is transforming itself based on lessons that we've learned around the world, but importantly as well from the Asia Pacific region, because we're going to go forward into the next decade to 2030. And through the next few months, we'll be kicking off this process in partnership with many of you. As I mentioned, we will be launching our annual report in January of 2021. And as we do that, we're going to be launching the recommitment process as well. And we're deeply committed to having civil society be at the heart of that recommitment process. So that as country governments are seeking to shape their new commitments, they'll do that in partnership with all of you, with civil society, so that everybody has transparency and visibility into the new commitments and everybody sees their role in working together to achieve these commitments. And we know particularly in the Asia Pacific region that we must look at areas around social and behavior change and gender norms that are part of the impediment to progress. And I really look forward to hearing from all of our speakers today about work that they're doing in, that, in those areas. Next slide, please. So for FP 2020, Many of you have participated in a consultation that we've been leading over the last year and a half now um, to learn what's been working in countries and to take us forward. So I wanna share with you what the next really year and a half looks like as we go through this process of transforming our partnership. We're sharing now this intent to change. We're finalizing a transition in our architecture. Our goal is to build regional hubs in each of the partner regions. So a hub in Asia, a hub in Africa, one in the East and um, Southern Africa, and one West and Central, so that we can work with Francophone countries as well. And then importantly, we're expanding the partnership into Latin American countries, where there's a high MCPR rate in many countries, but great inequities, both with a lot of teenage pregnancy, as well as indigenous and poor populations who lack access to fundamental services. So we're really excited that we're broadening our global scope. Um, we're hoping that through 2021, we can affect this transition and finally launch the full partnership at ICFP in November of 2021. Next slide, please. So we shared our vision last year about what we're working toward, which again is a future where all women and girls everywhere have the freedom and the ability to make this choice for themselves. So the change that we want to see in the world is really that everybody who wants to use contraceptives can use it and that they have the information and the products available to them so that they can make that choice in a well-informed way. We have five pillars for our work that we're going to do and those are the five gray boxes that you see there in the middle of the slide. But today we're going to focus most on that transform social and gender norms. And I'll be talking a lot about that because that's where the key partnership with civil society is going to be so fundamental to the success of the next iteration. Next slide, please. Along with this sort of new way of working with having regional hubs to bring us closer to all of you in the partner countries and with this um, intent to focus more on rights and on social norms, we've developed a new what we're calling a vision level results statement. And this statement is really guiding changes to our measurement framework. And that's right now we have the 18 core indicators. We'll be building on those core indicators to focus on three levels. The first is the individual, to be able to measure the health and well being outcomes that come from contraceptive use for women and girls. The second, is around a responsive health system. How is the health system meeting the needs of women and girls? Not just is it delivering a certain amount of services, but what is the impact on health and well-being? And thirdly, is a supportive uh, policy financing and accountability environment. And that's where we see all of us together 
civil society working hand in hand with governments and with service providers to ensure that the needs of women and girls are understood and then met. Next slide, please. So again, the way that we're going to do this is by um, focusing more on social and gender norms. From our global consultation, we identified this as a key area that everyone wants to focus on. Um, and we know that throughout the panel, again, that people will be talking a lot more about the aspects of this that are much broader than contraceptive use. But we understand that contraceptive use is the foundation for women and girls being able to make a lot of other decisions about their lives. Can they see in school? Is it the right time for them to be married? Is it the right time to expand their family if they have one, two, three, or maybe even more children, but to be able to pace that in a healthy way? And is the family supporting them to make those choices? The husband, the broader family, and the community itself. Because we understand that we have to invest, while we invest in strong health systems and strong supply chains are needed, we have to face the many barriers that are faced by women and couples in achieving their desired family size. And overcoming these barriers will require increased and sustained investment in social and behavior change. So social, cultural, and gender norms significantly and directly affect the ability of women and adolescent girls to control matters related to their reproductive health, adopt healthy reproductive health behaviors, including informed and voluntary use of modern contraception, which in turn has an impact on their overall health and well-being, as well as their family, their community, and their country. In, including, in addition to addressing these barriers between women and girls and access to a full range of modern contraceptive methods, programs must adopt advocacy interventions that address harmful norms and practices, such as early marriage and gender-based violence, as well as positive norms, such as keeping girls in school, involving men and boys as healthy partners in contraceptive use, and promoting a healthy timing and spacing of pregnancies. Next slide, please. As our panelists will discuss, community health workers and other gatekeepers, such as religious and community laws, are, are crucial partners to transforming gender norms. And they will highlight innovative tools that can be used to help us achieve the goals that we have, understanding again that we really need to lean in through advocacy and through accountability measures. This is where the new FP2030 partnership will also lean in with all of you. Having clear goals where everyone has a role, having well-funded advocacy campaigns, but importantly as well, having um, accountability frameworks at the commitment level, but also at the community level. How are we realizing our commitments to one another? And how are we realizing our goal of ensuring that all women and girls everywhere in the world have the same ability to make their decisions about their lives because they understand and can control their reproductive health and lives and decisions. So thank you again for having me today. And I look forward to learning from all the panelists today about the programs and processes that are really successful in your countries. So Dr. Eden, thank you very much for having me and back over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Beth. It's really very encouraging that uh, the plans of um, every 2020 is, uh, will be very, very, um, uh, what you call this, successful, I hope, yeah. I'm really certain that it, this will be successful and implemented in Asia and the Pacific countries. And I really appreciate the, the value when you said that the full participation of civil society in let's say in promoting uh, epi uh, family planning methods and most especially in, prom in promoting behavioral change communication. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is, uh, I know most of you, especially from UNFPA know her, Dr. Nita Shestra, and she'll be talking about, she'll be speaking on visiting service provider approach, reaching the unreachable, unrich with family planning services. If I may add, Dr. Nita is a public health professional with, with over 12 years of experience working in the area of sexual and reproductive health and HIV. She is the reproductive health specialist in UNFPA Nepal and provides technical oversight to SRHR programs. 
So, Dr. Nita, take it away. Hello and namaste, colleagues. It's a great great honor to get an opportunity to speak at the APCR SHR 10 virtual session. I'd like to thank for this opportunity. Uh, today, I'll be presenting on the visiting service provider approach initiated uh, initiated in Nepal to reach women and girls with family planning services. Uh, just to give you a brief introduction on the fa Nepal family planning scenario, Nepal has made tremendous progress in relation to promoting reproductive health and rights and commitment to promoting universal access to reproductive health, including family planning. It is one of the few countries in the region to have progressive standards and, commi and is commitment, committed to improving the rights of women and girls. And after hearing from Beth, I just want to add that Nepal is also one of the few, uh, one of the countries that made early commitments to Family Planning 2020 Global Partnership in 2015, with a pledge to increase funding for family planning, as well as to address the systemic barriers to family planning services. Despite the positive policy environment, there are persistent gaps. In the next few slides, I'll take you through the current family planning scenario in Nepal. In Nepal, one in four married women have an unmet need of family planning. Uh, and if you can see, look at this graph, you can see that modern contraceptive method use has not changed in the last, uh, in, since the 2006 and has plateaued at 43%. Further, disparities exist between different subgroups. This also indicates that Nepal's, Nepal needs to further strengthen the family planning program to achieve its commitments to global family planning goals. One particular group, a group that deserves special attention is young people. Adolescent motherhood continues to be a key health concern in Nepal. In fact, the adolescent birth rate has increased since last DHS in 2011. And the unmet need for family planning of adolescents aged 15 to 19 is highest. As you can see, it's 35%, which is highest of any age group. Early marriage is a key factor in Nepal and according to the demographic health survey, 41% of Nepali girls were married before the age of 18. In terms of unmet need, you can see in this graph that while 24% of married women in Nepal have an unmet need for family planning, 8% want to delay childbearing, while 16% wants to stop childbearing. 15% of the married women want to delay childbearing for at least two years, and 61% of married women do not want any more children. The total demand for family planning among married women in Nepal is therefore 76%. This slide in here is to give you a, a brief on the method mix scenario. While more than half of the married women uh, use any method of family planning, only 43 use a modern method and 10% use a traditional method. Further, if we look at the method mix, 20% resort to sterilization followed by 9% using injectable contraceptives with all other modern available methods at negligible le levels. As such, there is a need to improve the method mix over time with a balance between permanent, long-acting, reversible methods and short-acting methods. In terms of availability of family planning services in the health facilities, we can see from this figure in here that short-acting methods such as oral contraceptive pills and injectables are available in almost all the health facilities. However, less than half provide uh, IUDs and 59% of the service, service delivery pro serve points provide implant services. Moreover, just one in 10 family planning service providers have ever received training on long-acting reversible contraceptive methods. If we look at the stock status of family planning uh, commodities, studies have shown that while no stock out of uh, at least one or three method of family planning method is at 99% and 89% respectively, only 44% of the service delivery points had no stock out of at least five methods. So yes, there are many barriers related to family planning that need to be addressed. And when we look at the national indicators for Nepal, we also recognize that inequalities exist and disparities are widening. The rural, the minority, 
ethnic groups, the socially excluded, and the young are especially at a disadvantage in terms of accessing family planning services. Family planning among migrants is, and their spouses remains a challenge, and this is further likely to be impacted in the current situation of COVID-19 with high number of migrants that are returning and will be returning in the near future. Lack of women's empowerment to make decisions, myths and misconceptions related to family planning methods, early marriage and early fertility is also a concern. Early marriage often mean the end of girl's education, setting aside her chances of a career and undermining her life choices and her right, human rights. Girls who marry young are often pressurized to have children right away, which pose risk to their health and well-being, including unwanted pregnancies and adverse outcomes related to childbirth. Furthermore, studies have shown that nearly half of the pregnancies in Nepal were unintended and one third ended in abortion. Fewer than half uh, of all abortions were provided in, only, only fewer than half were provided in legally approved institutions, which gives a clear indication of uns unsafe abortions happening among women and girls. So against this backdrop, uh, the Ministry of Health and Population Family Welfare Division, along with partners including UNFPA, supported the introduction of visiting service provider approach. So who are these visiting service providers? As the name suggests, visiting service providers are trained health service providers who visit primary public health facilities on a scheduled day to deliver long acting reversible contraceptive methods where trained competent health service providers are not available. They provide on-site coaching and mentoring support to health service uh, providers and also support in quality improvement and with their involvement in quality improvement assessments. The VSPs are mobilized to increase the access and uptake of long-acting reversible contraceptive methods, expanding the coverage, especially in hard-to-reach areas. And in the picture above, you can see here a visiting service provider traveling with her backpack with family planning supplies to a health facility in one of the remotest part of the country, some requiring travel on foot up to six to eight hours. So how are visiting service providers mobilized in the health facilities? This figure in here outlines the overall process, which starts from coordination and planning at the provincial and local level to identify priority areas, followed by identification of hard to reach areas and sites with low utilization of family planning services. Further, health facilities requiring, requiring large services, training needs for health service providers, commodities, supplies are then assessed. And based on this, health facilities are set, selected and agreed upon at the local level for mobilizing visiting service providers. Additionally, throughout the process, female community health volunteers are mobilized at the community level to provide information and referrals for family planning services at the community level. So uh, I, for the next few slides, I'll just briefly take you through the key achievements we've made through the, uh, by the visiting service providers. Over the period of 27 to September 2020, a total of 540 health facilities in 11 low CPR districts were supported by visiting service providers. 61 visiting service providers were mobilized in a scheduled basis and over 400 health service providers were trained in providing implant and IUCD services. I would like to also highlight in here that these VSPs have been instrumental in continuing family planning services in the current situation of restricted mobility and lockdown due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in this slide, if you can look, um, uh, look at the trend in use of long-acting reversible contraceptive methods, implant and IUCDs, it clearly shows that the uptake of large services are increasing over the years. And these figures constitute approximately half of the total large service uptake in the district. This figure in here shows the uptake of large services among different ethnic groups. We can see in this figure that 56% of the users were from marginalized communities. In this picture, you can see a visiting service provider providing information session about family planning to men staying at quarantine center 
in one of the remotest districts in the country. So um, these are the key achievements from this approach so far. Um, of course, sustainability of this approach is, has been a big question. So in order to ensure sustainability and continuity of services following visiting service provider approach uh, to the primary health services, a holistic approach is being followed. UNFPA is continuously engaging at the provincial and local level to sensitize, family plan, uh, sensitize the, the need for family planning services, advocacy for adequate financing for family planning, including adopting the VSP approach by the local government until all health service providers are trained. Training for health service providers, coaching and mentoring of health service providers, ensuring quality improvements are processes are in place, ensuring commodities and disseminating information at the community level through female community health volunteers. Um, in conclusion, I would like to say that our VSP approach has been successful in expanding choices for family planning and ensuring family planning demands are met. It focuses on the key elements of right to health availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality. The VSP approach has further contributed in expanding coverage of family planning services, reaching the most marginalized and furthest behind, both at stable and unstable times, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to end by saying that the FP 2020 has brought a lot of attention to these issues and really created a momentum to focus on family planning. The policies are in place to address the reproductive health and rights of women in Nepal, but there is a need to strengthen the implementation, especially in the changed, federal, changed context of federalism and the rapidly evolving situation due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our major challenges is sustaining the gains and achieving the aspirations and targets of sustainable development goals particularly in achieving universal access to SRH services and tailoring our efforts towards reaching the unreached. Uh, and in the end, I'd like to acknowledge the Family Welfare Division, DFID, who is supporting this initiative, uh, Mary Stops International, Sunolo Pariyar Nepal, Atra Nepal, who is our implementing partners and my UNFP colleagues, along with the smiling visiting service provider that you can see in this picture. Thank you so much. Over to you, Eden. We can't hear you, Eden. Please unmute yourself. Oh, thank you, Dr. Nita. And um, we, we are really inspired by your presentation because of the, uh, of the visiting service providers who have really effectively reach out to the marginalized groups. And um, our next presenter is uh, no other than Dr. Pramesh Chandra Bhatnagar, who, who is a legend by himself, spending more than 25 years in public health. He is the senior director of the Voluntary Health Association in, of India, and his focus of work is community, communicable disease control, including vector-borne diseases like TB, uh, HIV, and adolescent health, including SRHR. So he will talk about peer-led approach for promoting change in sociocultural norms in a conservative rural community in order to reduce child marriage and promote friendly SRHR. Okay, Dr. PC, are you ready? Yes, Adam, thank you very much. Yes. Okay, so good afternoon everyone from India and good morning to people away and whatever is the feasible time. Basically, today I'm going to share a small presentation on one of our multi-country project termed as Marriage No Child Play 
being implemented in many countries, including India, under an alliance called MTBA. So this project is being implemented in one of the eastern part of India, that is in Odisha, and location is Ganjam district, Khalikot block. So we are in this part, we are covering 177 villages with population of roughly around 1,70,000. Now, the present presentation is basically to focus our work, sharing the strategy, sharing the methodology, sharing the result, and how this work can be taken forward, as well as last six, seven months, what we are facing through COVID, how this approach has worked for the COVID control in the geographical area where we are working. Now, basically, why we worked on child marriage. In, in, in the Indian context, child marriage is quite prevalent. More than, if you look at the global figure, more than one third child marriage are in India. In the Indian context, more than 25% are in the state of Odisha. Odisha is where one of the highest prevailing child marriages when we initiated. Now it is not so high. And before starting our work, we had a, a small baseline study to understand what are the denominators which are promoting the child marriage. One part, the local culture and tradition. Second was lack of education. Third was extreme poverty. And fourth was insecurity because of all these factors. And what were some of the interesting findings of our baseline survey were that knowledge about the adolescent and reproductive and sexual health was pretty low. Girls, or roughly around only 10 to 11 percent girls had any information about menstruation, even among those who have started menstruating. And other interesting feature of this which we have never thought of that we will come across in remote rural area of the country is prevalence of premarital sex and relationship, which was pretty high. More than almost 40% of girls were having these kind of relations and one can anticipate what was happening with such low knowledge about the contraceptive methods and all such low knowledge about reproductive health and such high level of sexual work and HIV AIDS related information was hardly two to three percent. So we thought okay when we are working for this child marriage we took up as one of the case study for promoting adolescent and reproductive health. So what we did as, a, as I said as a part of our baseline survey we identified barriers for youth and adolescent across access to SRHR services and reasons for high prevalence of child marriage. Following this identification, we did a total mapping of adolescent in all our locations. After doing the mapping, we organized initial workshops to facilitate the group formation. Once groups were formed, we again organize capacity building efforts for the groups and as a part of that capacity building also identify the peer educators. Now this identification and finalization was not done by the project team. It was done by the group members themselves. Following the identification, these peer educators were trained on sexual reproductive health rights, life skill education, and apart from the groups, community leaders and community based organizations were also oriented because we don't want to work for these groups and the peer educators to work in isolation. So we built the capacities of other existing
community groups and community leaders then what we were finding that even though now community has started raising demands but services are very limited because of so many factors including remoteness so we organized orientation programs and advocacy efforts for to ensure that existing government health centers they become adolescent friendly health centers and ad we advocated as well as motivated adolescent girls to submit demand charter particularly focusing on child marriage as a part of our advocacy work we did lobbying with the government on child marriage and now all these were the activities but how we could work out whether we are moving in the right direction or not so to facilitate that monitoring as well as community engagement we developed along with the community members a community based monitoring tool having indicators on srhr and child marriage and last but not least we actively engaged the male population for promoting both the things that is prevention of child marriage and promoting adolescent sexual health we didn't limit our work only for working with the women and girls so as i said that when we were looking into this whole part what we did we didn't limit our work only to the medical model of family welfare we took into the comprehensive model so we worked for the economic empowerment which included vocational training which included providing support to girls for starting small initiatives including maybe a small shop something like that different type of ventures and the most preferred work for the girls in that area was computer training and mobile repairing these were the two major areas where they excelled we empowered them like as i was saying ki this was one of the remote area so provision of simple bicycles for moving attending the schools going for training going far away from the village that was a major major support to these girls advocacy we had advocacy at different levels with the local panchayat local leadership district level staff government staff as well as formal leadership so all these efforts helped us in developing an enabling environment because on the basis of our baseline and our work we thought that without creating an enabling environment we cannot have a sustainable social change and here we were talking in a given community where women do not have very high status outside the home or outside the books bringing the girls out making them educator making them educating the people we th thought that enabling environment is extremely important so by all these methods we created an enabling environment then this is what we did you can see a glimpse of community monitoring tool these all are group women community group which monitors the work local health workers school teachers as well as panchayat members are part of that and every month during this meeting villagers and this group comes out with a village health plan and in the next meeting all the workers who are supposed to fulfill that plan they come up and report whatever they have done and if they couldn't do anything so they were asked what were the reasons and if there was any problem which required intervention then these village women and adolescent girl used to make intervention especially by visiting the local staff and because as i said that we worked with the local government health system we did provided alternative systems so they were well versed with our work as well as part of this whole system so community based monitoring tool was an empowering tool for the local women and the community and this is the adolescent leadership 
we promoted the as i mentioned we promoted adult adolescent leadership through capacity building providing them opportunity promoting their education promoting their social skills helping them in getting the jobs as well as vocational training so this approach has done wonderful work in that area and what we have been able to achieve so through this intervention we have built capacity of more than 500 groups adolescent groups 250 self help groups 300 community leaders and more than 11000 adolescents so 70 information dissemination centers were formed these centers are managed by the adolescent peer educators themselves so these centers have enough educational material information including demonstration of contraceptive products on a regular basis by government health functionary out of the existing health centers we could convert 11 centers into adolescent health friendly centers and we followed all the well recognized definitions given by the un who and government of india that which type of centers are going to be called as adolescent friendly health centers and one thing which happened that all these centers had kept a afternoon time when centers were not open for general public for adolescent to come and share their issues so they could visit the centers after their school hours to discuss with a auxiliary nurse midwife or other health staff including medical doctor their issues and because of all these efforts 128 proposed child marriage cases were averted and in that adolescent girls peer educators and their groups played a major major role and we have trained them as a part of our interventions in advocacy and negotiation so they negotiated with their families only in few rare cases project staff was required to work with the families so like that after that 26 villages have been declared by the district administration as child marriage free in 44 villages no child marriage case in last two years so but because of covid we couldn't declare them now one situation is better we will have this these villages also declared child marriage free 95% institutional deliveries and birth registration increased utilization of contraceptives and community monitoring of adolescent friendly srhr services so these are some of the results of our interventions and in conclusion we can say that present intervention highlight how a peer led comprehensive strategy involving adolescent girls and boys village opinion leaders self help groups other community based organization and civil society organization can help creating sustainable youth friendly and enabling environment required for improving the access to srhr services for the youth iec and bcc strategy which were developed and adopted by the project helped in increasing the outreach and furthering the behavioral change among the adults and girls boys engaging key stakeholders like village health workers school teachers government officials panchayat members helped us in influencing the socio cultural norms of child marriage and last but not the least the cbmt indicators and the method which has been developed help community in monitoring the outreach activities have taking place in their village and they are using these things for promoting not just the srhr but also looking into other developmental projects taking place in the community now the second part is how we worked in during the covid for this so now basically during the covid all our work was focused on using the groups whatsapp groups peer groups and all that part as a part of our work all the girls who were trained especially who were doing the stitching they were trained in making mask they made the mask and distributed it so 
we organize virtual training sessions on SRHR and COVID-19. Sanitary napkins were distributed to more than 5,000 girls through peer educators. And there were regular interaction with adults and group members through WhatsApp group. Now what has happened because of the COVID, our WhatsApp group have become very, very active. And in every place we have so many groups now and many more asking us to involve them in these groups and related activities. Supported stitching masks. So 80 girls were trained and 8,000 masks were distributed with support from peer leaders, PRI, ASHA and Anganwadi workers. One more thing which we did at the beginning of COVID was we set up a local helpline number. All the girls were given the number of their peer educator and peer educators were given the number of our project leader, including my own number. So whenever they had any query on COVID-19 SRHR related issues, they were, these inquiries were responded and this information was available right from 7 a.m. in the morning to 9 p.m. six days a week, except for Sunday. So this way we worked out and through this number, they were also able to access the information given by the state government and whatever their concerns which were coming from the field, they were shared with the state government staff and other people. So that was voices from the field which were shared. So these all are personal hygiene kit and other things held. So we focused on both the things, social distancing, mask, and frequent use of sanitizers and hand washing for COVID. So that is in a nutshell how we work for a SRHR in using our working with our peer groups. Thank you very much everyone for your patient hearing. Over to Eden. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. PC. Um, it was re the program is indeed very comprehensive. And it covers a lot of, let's say, um, uh, interventions addressing the concerns of child marriage, like child marriage, social cultural barriers, even uh, involving uh, men or young people in peer education and in, and of course, the one, one significant, uh, let's say, good practice is how, what you're doing now, um, as far as the COVID pandemic is concerned. And uh, of course, there are so many life skills seminars and uh, learning developments for the youth. So before I proceed to the next speaker, um, our participants, dear participants, um, your questions will be answered right after the last uh, presenter. So please bear with us. And then we now go to the next, uh, the next presenter. Um, Berin Shia, who is from IPAS, Pakistan. Okay. As you know, IPAS Pakistan is an international NGO working on the provision of safe SRHR for women in various countries. Okay. So she'll be presenting, uh, I think, a research study, no? Increasing the lady health workers' knowledge of sexual and reproductive health and rights addressing the knowledge gaps and improving linkages within rural communities in Pakistan. Okay, Maureen, take it away, please. Thanks, Adin. Hi, everyone. Uh, it is an honor to present in front of you all today, and I hope we all get to learn something new from each other. Um, thanks, Bobby, for the slides. Uh, so, okay, uh, like Adam said, the topic for today's presentation is increasing lady health workers' knowledge of sexual and reproductive health and rights, addressing knowledge gaps, and improving linkages within rural communities in Pakistan. Next slide, please. So, according to a national study on post-abortion complications in Pakistan, we found that around 2.2 million abortions occur in Pakistan annually, and more than 80% of these women are attended by traditional birth attendants uh, called TBAs or untrained uh, mid-level providers, which leads to complications. 
although there is an abortion law in the country uh, but due to myths and uh, stigmas around it it's often perceived that um, it is illegal in pakistan abortion is illegal in pakistan however abortion law in pakistan it allows to save a woman's life or to provide necessary treatment in early pregnancy um hence the situation calls for an effort to reduce the effects of harmful socio cultural norms which affect women and girls sexual and reproductive health and rights in in pakistan which is a highly patriarchal society next slide please so i would like to give you a background of the intervention that i would be talking about today um lady health worker program it's a program which was established in 1994 by the government of pakistan the goal was to provide uh, primary care services to understand popula uh, to underserved populations in rural and urban areas of the country so lhws are community based health workers working under the department of health government of pakistan they are based in rural community after receiving 15 months training in family planning and primary health care through public health care system of the country and each lhw serves about 250 households in her catchment area and uh, their scope of work includes uh, they would be visiting four to five households per day for health promotion and prevention on different uh, aspects like family planning counseling antenatal and postnatal care referrals child vaccination campaigns such as polio and dengue etc next slide please thank you so now i would be talking about uh, the specific intervention uh, uh, that we are working uh, around before that i would like to give a brief background of ipas ipas is an ngo working on the provision of srhr services in various regions of the world for decades now but in pakistan we are working since 2000 uh, 2007 and um we so ips interventions aim to enhance women and girls knowledge and access to contraception and safe uterine evacuation or post abortion care by minimizing the effects of harmful socio cultural norms which affect women and girls sexual and reproductive health and rights at ips we adopt a multi pronged approach we work at policy level by advocating for policy and regulatory changes for safe rh services and on health system level we build the capacity of uh, the healthcare providers of the public health system of the country and on community level we engage with the community via these um, um lady health workers and we also work with the uh, male segment of the uh, of the, the of the department so this specific project it's called improving access to high quality post abortion and comprehensive um, contraceptive care for women and girls we work with department of health to address the ue pack knowledge gaps in rural settings and um, like i said we we use lady health workers as a medium to reach to the community we train these lady health workers on ipas developed iec sbc tool i will um, be showing you a few slide a few pictures of the tools that are that we use and then we train these lady health workers on these sbc tools and these trained lady health workers then conduct awareness session with the community women and girls and at each stage just to see how much correct knowledge those um, community women or the, those lady health workers have we conduct a pre assessment test and then we also conduct a post assessment test where we evaluate their knowledge and we check how much percentage increase has been there in the correct knowledge of the participants next slide please thank you so this is one um, um one um, example of the ic tool that we used this picture is it's called sihat ki dastak and uh, it's termed in urdu and this contains um information on abor abortion types pack danger signs in post abortion family planning so the aim of this tool is to enhance knowledge on pakistan abortion law safe pathways of ue pack and enhance community linkage in the referrals to ips supported facilities next slide please Here is another example of uh, of an IC tool that we use. These IC tools, these uh, we have provided technical support to the government of Pakistan. Uh, the National Ministry of Health of Pakistan has endorsed these tools, and also, respectively, the uh, these are being used in the other provinces of the country by the governments, respective governments of the of the provinces. So this is another tool. Uh, it's a safe path when referrals. uh this is approved by the, again by the government of pakistan and it's for married couples so this starts with prenatal consultation for uh, for for the for the people that um, for the married couples and it further further tells us um about that uh, about the 
about the, de uh, the delay in their first uh, pregnancy or not, uh, which is something which is highly discouraged in, a, in our culture, where uh, you are expected to have your first child as soon as possible. And it also further tells us um, about what to do in case of intended pregnancy and what not to do, or also uh, intended or unintended pregnancy both. So it tells the newly married couples um, on how to go about if there's an intended pregnancy or if there's not an intended pregnancy. Next slide, please. So now I would be uh, talking about the actual impact of the IPS intervention. Um, uh, and the data that I would be presenting is uh, from October 2018 to September 2019. So following a cascade training model, uh, during this time period, we trained 41 master and 141 facility trainers through 14 sessions. And um, these trainers, then they further trained uh, one to, uh, 1,260 LHWs, who then further um, through 2,700 community sessions disseminated this information to 49,300 women and girls using the same IC tool the, uh, tools that I just showed before. And like I said, during each session, uh, there has been a pre and post training assessment that has been conducted. And um, so it is, uh, like I said before, it is to gauge the correct knowledge on abortion law, PAC, danger signs, UE PAC, safe, unsafe methods, and recommended uh, post-abortion family planning methods after incomplete abortion and uh, fertility return after termination of pregnancy. And uh, the average test score uh, resulted uh, of these LA lady health workers was 33% correct. So before the session was conducted, we took a test of their correct knowledge and the correct uh, knowledge of these LHWs were 33% correct. And after the session, we again measured their knowledge and the, the knowledge uh, this time uh, was 76% um, and which shows there, there was a 43% increase in their correct knowledge, which is a huge um, increase um, in their correct knowledge. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is uh, this is the cascade model that I just talked about. This is a this is a training model through which uh, we disseminate uh, the information. First is we train the master trainers training uh, that is training of the district master trainers, and then these uh, district master trainers then train the further trainers for LH uh, lady health workers, lady health visitors, and lady health. Um, uh, supervisors and then they further conduct the training of lady health workers uh, it's a trickling down effect and then these lady health workers further conduct community awareness sessions with women and girls um, uh, in their respective communities next slide please thank you um, so we conducted uh, the pre and post knowledge assessment of these community women on fertility return, danger signs, identification and update of VFP and the pre-session knowledge, like I said, was 47% correct and post score was um, uh, 87%, showing an increase of 38% in their correct knowledge. And over this period of time, um, these lady workers have referred 1,518 women to facilities and from these number, 1,135 were served by the trained providers, uh, which we trained as a part of uh, this whole intervention, which is uh, which is a whole different subject, which uh, and I don't have enough time to talk about that. And these were served by trained providers for post-abortion care and post-abortion family planning. And uh, the average result, uh, you can see there has been an increase of 38% from their knowledge. Initially, it was 47% correct. And then after uh, they were um, trained and the knowledge increased to 85% and the, the, percentage, the percentage change was 38%. It's again a huge number. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, we, I, uh, we, uh, IPES, we co collaborate with the Department of Health to address the overall knowledge gap that exists in the country on uh, SRHR of lady health workers in the rural settings of Pakistan. In Pakistan, lady health workers are a potential source through which uh, referrals can be increased and the trickling down of correct knowledge via trained LHWs, it can strengthen the linkages and increase referrals from the community and it, it also increases the correct knowledge of the community women on SRHR. And, um, 
and uh, we are um, we are also now working on um, on the male uh, segment of the of the of the department where we are we would be engaging the men and to so so that they further when they go into the community they would be um, they would be working with the male segment of the community as as i said before this is a patriarchal society where uh, a woman does not have uh, a lot to say about her own uh, srhr rights because uh, the society that we live in we have uh, we have we have a strict environment where um, her srhr uh, rights are pretty much controlled by her husband and uh, sometimes her in-laws as well yeah so that's it thank you Eden. and i yeah. would be perhaps taking the questions uh, when we end the session yeah thank you very much marine again yeah. we're seeing that uh, outreach workers especially your lady that lady health workers are really very effective in promoting let's say the knowledge or an appreciation of srhr so we now go to the last speakers Okay, and uh, they are Elisa Oreglia and Camille Tijitimajo. So they will be talking about um, smartphone use and reproductive health in Cambodia, a qualitative multidisciplinary exploratory study. As you know, Camille is a Filipino and I'm proud of that, and, uh, but she has been based in Cambodia. <laughs> And uh, she is the operations director of Marie Stopes International in Cambodia. And in her current position, she manages marketing and communication research, monitoring, and evaluation contact centers. Um, Elisa, her colleague, Oreglia, is the lecturer of global digital cultures of King's College based in London. And she, has, she studies how marginalized communities in the global South become users of digital technologies, etc. Okay, so the titles of the title of their presentation is Smartphone, Smartphone News and Reproductive Health in Cambodia, a qualitative multidisciplinary exploratory study. Okay, Camille, who, who, who will be the first? Camille or Elisa? Uh, Elisa, that's me going oh, hi, first. Hi, Elisa. Hello, yes. Uh, hello, and uh, thank you for uh, this wonderful introduction. Thank you for having us present and uh, uh, for actually managing to create such a great sense of, co of community even in an online uh, conference. Uh, uh, so uh, Camille and myself are going to present uh, the results of uh, this uh, um, research project that took place over two years and that saw a lot of people involved, as you can see here from uh, uh, the co-authors uh, list. And uh, um, so I want to just quickly tell you about uh, uh, the background, why there are so many people involved, and then uh, we're going to talk mostly about uh, um, smartphone news and social media rather than uh, reproductive health uh, uh, per se. So um, let me start with uh, what we are looking for. Uh, the um, uh, PI, the person who put together this uh, big project is uh, uh, Chris Smith from uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and uh, he had done work in the past in Cambodia to look at uh, um, medical abortion, uh, uh, follow-up care, and uh, uh, mobile phone text messages. And uh, as the smartphones started to become uh, increasingly uh, widespread uh, uh, in Cambodia, he got curious to uh, understand if there were uh, possibilities to um, connect the use of smartphones with uh, uh, reproductive health, uh, medical abortion, etc. And so uh, he, we put together a team that uh, uh, included uh, uh, people who, with expertise, of course, in the medical field, but also uh, in the cultural, uh, soci sociological fields and uh, on uh, information sharing practices. Because we really wanted to um, understand, uh, first of all, how do uh, people, and in this case, we were looking specifically at uh, um, uh, female factory workers in Phnom Penh. So how do they use their smartphones? 
um, I study uh, the use of uh, uh, new digital technologies uh, among marginal populations in the global south. And uh, I know that we have a lot of assumptions uh, about how uh, they use uh, smartphones, but often we don't have adequate knowledge. And so uh, we started uh, uh, really looking on a, in a qualitative way, just by uh, interviewing, by observing people, uh, trying to understand how do they use the smartphones uh, uh, and is there uh, an opportunity for um, information about uh, um, healthcare in general, reproductive health, uh, and specifically about uh, uh, medical abortion? Is there a way to uh, reach more uh, people with uh, uh, better uh, information? So let's talk a little bit about what we discovered uh, about this uh, new um, mobile internet users. So. Uh, here's a, a quick picture of uh, uh, the uh, number of uh, um, uh, smartphone users and internet uh, users, social media users in Cambodia. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, um, there's, uh, first of all, the thing that really stands out is that uh, uh, social media use uh, is uh, um, you know, very widespread, is over 50% of the population, but also social media use means uh, smartphone use, so Facebook, uh, YouTube, WhatsApp, etc., are accessed uh, mostly through uh, smartphones. And this is something that I believe happens in uh, uh, many countries uh, uh, in Asia Pacific. So uh, how does this uh, um, uh, smartphone social media use work? Well, the one thing to keep in mind is that it's a very irregular uh, use. It's characterized by an on-off pattern. Uh, that is because there is a constant churn of uh, uh, phones themselves, because phones uh, uh, get lost, get uh, broken, get stolen, uh, but also constant change of uh, uh, phone numbers, because uh, uh, people are still, a lot of users, the majority of users actually, um, I think about 90% of users in Cambodia, are using uh, um, uh, SIM cards with uh, pay-as-you-go contracts, and they keep on changing them to find best deals, but also they have developed a lot of strategies to save uh, airtime, uh, which means consuming a lot of content uh, that is downloaded directly uh, to smartphones rather than uh, accessed uh, through uh, the use of uh, data to, through their uh, SIM card. So uh, this uh, means that uh, uh, even though uh, people might have uh, uh, smartphones, might have internet connections, those are not always on internet connection, so there might, they might not, not always be reachable. Um, use of smartphones is uh, very collaborative, uh, which is uh, a way to say that uh, the smartphones are not terribly uh, private. Um, there's often a collective effort to get uh, uh, phones, uh, uh, social media accounts, etc., set up. Uh, just to give you an idea, a lot of the phones that uh, our interviews showed us uh, uh, had their um, uh, interface in English. So it wasn't even changed to uh, Khmer, the local language. And that meant that uh, you know, people could use it, figure out how things work, but whenever there was uh, uh, you know, you know, maybe a, an announcement or something that went wrong and that was in English, they needed someone else to uh, help them out. So uh, this means that there is very little uh, privacy uh, in the sense that uh, a phone is often, can often be accessed by uh, other people, uh, or there are other people that are involved in setting up social media accounts and so they know username and passwords of such accounts. Um, another very important part of this smartphone news is that uh, there is a strong preference for non-text-based communication. Um, Facebook and YouTube are the internet, and that's also something that is uh, very common among new users of digital technology. Uh, Google and Google search are unknown, even though a lot of people use Android phones. And so the Google search bar is the first thing you see on the home screen. But a lot of people are just not aware of what that is. Um, I, by uh, preference for non-text-based communication, I mean that uh, even when people can read, can write, do read and do write, they prefer to engage with content that is not written, so videos, uh, uh, audio, uh, images, and that's also the way they interact with uh, uh, content. So uh, likes, shares, uh, emoticons, forwarding uh, uh, content pages, etc., is a very rich form of engagement, even though there might not be uh, any text. 
um, YouTube is an interesting uh, uh, case because it is, we discovered that it is uh, uh, the site where um, the, uh, a lot of the young women we uh, interviewed started to experiment with uh, search. That is because YouTube is used to uh, look for uh, music and film. And so uh, people have a very ready search string. So they know that they are gonna look for a special, a specific title. And so they can type that in the search box and that gives them experience in uh, what it means to search, what it means to type and what it means to assess the, um, the result of the search. Um, so the next question is, are smartphones used to search for health information, um, reproductive health information, any kind of health information? And there was a bit of skepticism uh, on the part of uh, uh, health NGO workers, but also um, we ourselves didn't uh, find any interviewee who said, yes, I have uh, used uh, my smartphone to look for um, you know, family planning, contraception, etc. Um, so we thought to do a little uh, experiment and, uh, um, you know, just imagine, okay, if people are looking for um, information on medical abortion, on reproductive health uh, uh, online, on Facebook and YouTube, what will they find? And so we focused on YouTube again, because as I said, that's where people experiment with search and uh, we uh, search in Khmer for a variety of uh, terms. Uh, related to reproductive health and medical abortion, abortion uh, that we got from uh, um, Camille and uh, her team and other NGOs in Cambodia. And uh, what, we discovered, what we discovered was that none of the videos that we found had been posted by um, health NGOs or government sources, even though such videos exist because we did find them when we searched in uh, English. So it means that the videos are optimized for an English speaking and an English search uh, audience. However, we did find uh, uh, quite a number of uh, videos uh, on these topics that had been mostly uploaded by private health clinics, uh, media outlets, and some people just trying to uh, figure out how to monetize traffic on YouTube. Uh, and these videos were characterized by the fact that their production values were very low. So sometimes they were simply uh, narrated PowerPoint slides uh, but they were also very easy to follow, very uh, instructional. So we found, for example, a narrated PowerPoint slideshow that, with instructions on how to use medical abortion uh, that uh, you know, were just posted by someone uh, uh, who, um, I, who was an, a private health care provider. And another characteristic is that on videos posted on YouTube, the people who post such videos often respond to comments. And uh, there are comments that ask follow-up questions on the presentation, ask sometimes very personal uh, questions. So, uh, you know, uh, how, what are the side effects or what do I do if? Uh, and often these postings uh, uh, appear with what looks like the actual name of uh, uh, the person who posts. Um, and uh, we want to emphasize that uh, this doesn't mean that people don't value their privacy. It means that the privacy online is very difficult to, uh, to see and to manage. So they might not want to post with their name on such a public platform, but they don't know how to not post with their name. Um, before I leave uh, uh, the presentation to Camille, I want to talk quickly about the implication of this, which for uh, healthcare providers uh, means that, uh, you know, new so the, the social media, the uh, fact that uh, smartphones are becoming so widespread uh, is an opportunity to uh, reach more people with uh, uh, accurate, uh, actionable information. Uh, the big challenges are, however, the issue of privacy, uh, the fact that people need to feel that they're connecting with the human, and there is a personal connection, as Camille will describe in a second, and uh, uh, so that creates a huge amount of uh, uh, work to keep on top of all these social media channels, etc. As a practical suggestion, um, when you have web pages, video description, Facebook posts, etc., um, they, they should be optimized to uh, local languages, but also to uh, everyday language. So uh, have keywords in, uh, that use the medical, popular, and slang terms for things like uh, uh, abortion or contraception will help um, reach more users. And uh, you know, instructional videos with content that is accurate, accessible, actionable. Uh, and optimize for uh, YouTube and web searches is what looks to us like a, an easy first step to 
try to get uh, um, accurate information out there. And now Camille will discuss some of the implication of this for the work of uh, uh, MSI Cambodia. Camille. Hi, thank you very much, Elisa. And again, good afternoon, good morning to all of our participants. So I'm here to, today to talk about um, MSI Cambodia's work in terms of social media and digital marketing. So in our organization, we have multi-channel communication platforms to provide comprehensive information and services on sexual and reproductive health, including contraception and safe abortion. So currently we have Facebook, we have YouTube and messaging apps like WhatsApp, Telegram. And we also manage a contact center. So the contact center is the central hub of information, advice, counseling and services referrals. Um, and again, on contraception, safe abortion and other sexual and reproductive health services. So people can call us and they can send us a message on Facebook or they can send us an email um, if they want some questions or if they want to access services in MSI clinics or uh, their nearby public health facilities. As of date, we have more than 87,000 followers in Facebook and uh, more than 50% of them are actually young people and mostly living in the urban areas. We post content related to safe abortion, contraception, reproductive health, empowerment, addressing stigma and inclusion. And on an average, we receive about 300 uh, private messages in a month. And most of them are related to the content um, that we posted. Um, every month as well in the contact center, we receive an about, an about 1,200 calls. And um, through those calls, we were able to refer about 300 clients to get services in our MSI clinics um, and then nearby facilities. And 23% um, of our callers are actually young people as well. We provide um, appointment booking, um, client care follow-up, and um, counselors are also doing client satisfaction surveys. So Elisa's re research um, and survey are ve very helpful on um, managing the contact center and for the organizations to really understand the behavior of our, our users, especially the garment factory workers. Um, and then from the finding as well, we know that instructional videos are very effective in disseminating information, um, especially on sexual and reproductive health. So during those um, interventions, we're able to actually produce a video um, on how to use medical abortion um, that, that was posted in our Facebook and, um, and YouTube channel. And in Facebook, as of date, we've had 59,000 views and about 2,000 engagements on the video. And um, we've also seen an increase of views in YouTube. It's about around 4,000 um, views. And 82% um, of the searchers, searches in YouTube actually, they type in medical abortion pills. So when we're looking at the report from YouTube and we're looking at the keywords that they were searching on the platform, we see the term medical abortion pills, we see the term abortion, we see the term abortion in Cambodia. So um, that um, in effect is really um, effective because um, Cambodians are able to get um, correct information, especially in medical abor abortion, and they were able to get that information um, um, through these different platforms. Next slide, Elisa. So, um, so as I've said, we manage a multi-channel communication uh, platform. Um, although it provides a lot of opportunities in reaching um, different people, um, there are a lot of challenges that we are facing. So the first, um, as you know, Alison mentioned, in terms of privacy, so, and also not everyone have access to Facebook and social media. Um, especially on uh, in rural areas. So even though um, a lot of people are actually have smartphones, the access to internet is still limited, especially in the remote areas. Um, another one is follow up and referrals are important. So it's it's not just about information um, giving out to the audience, but ensuring that we are following up with their concerns, with their inquiries, and then to ensure that they get um, appropriate services that they need. Um, to safe and quality um, facilities such as MSI. Um, it's also important um, because we, it's, it enables us to drive sustainability of the channel. So apart from just providing information, they are able to also get services 
um, in the facilities. There's also little awareness of public versus private communication on the part of the users. Um, so, for example, when uh, people comment on a post, we answer their comments on, on the Facebook page, but then our counselors are also sending them a private message to continue the conversation so that we can be able to personalize um, the answer and also to ensure that we understand their needs and be able to provide um, the appropriate answers and um, information that they um, require. There's also little knowledge um, of who the users are on the part of the information healthcare providers, um, unless these digital encounters turn into referral using becoming clients. So again, in this platform, um, we, we, we don't have enough information on, on them unless they're able to provide us with um, their details every time we are able to refer them to, to a clinic um, nearby. So, um, but then apart from just you know, gender or age or their location, we don't have a lot of understanding of who they are. Um, and there's also a large amount of repetitive answers to common questions. So what we did in the contact center is we have a lot of FAQs um, listed. So we gathered a lot of uh, frequently asked questions and then um, we have autosave replies so that it's easier for our counselors to provide answers um, and at the same time personalize those answers to the needs of, of our clients or for our, our callers. Um, so um, the contact center is especially Facebook and social media channels um, are very essential in disseminating comprehensive information and reaching out to those who are in need, especially during the pandemic. So we've seen an increase in our messages on Facebook. Um, we've seen increase on calls. We've seen increase in questions related to sexual and productive health. Um, because they're not able to travel. Um, the only access that they have is either online or phone consultations. So it's, these are important to ensure that they get the information and services that they need in contraception, safe abortion, and other sexual and productive health services. Um, that's it for me. So again, thank you very much for uh, listening. So thank you so much, Elisa and Camille. So we're done with uh, our presentations. <clears throat> but before we go to the question and answer, uh, which will be handled by Shoka, I would like just like to summarize. Okay. Within, the, um, within the framework of Beth's uh, presentation, which is the direction and the vision and the direction of the FP 2020, you are muted. Eden, you are muted. I'm sorry. I'm sorry again. Okay, so thank you very much for all the presentations. And um, before we go to the questions and answers, I would just like to summarize a bit um, the, the four presentations, plus, of course, Beth's uh, uh, plenary uh, presentation. So following the uh, every 2020 framework and its direction, not only that of... Uh, and also our the, the respective countries, let's say, direction towards SRHR for all, we're really blessed to have with us uh, the, these four speakers who have really presented good practices in their respective countries, such as the use of the social media, most especially, which has really, which needs very, very great improvement in terms of usage and appreciation, especially among young people. And then we had, of course, Dr. Pisi's presentation on peer-led education and uh, behavioral change communication among the youth uh, to prevent, let's say, uh, to stop uh, child marriage and, other, and early pregnancies and so on. And then significantly, we have similar, almost similar um, interventions are being done by UNFPA by the use of their volunteers and also that of Marine. So given all this, they aptly presented what they're doing now. And of course, uh, Beth is saying that we hope the hubs or the regional hubs which will be uh, um, formed 
this coming year or so will really be more effective. So most of all, we learned so much from all of you. And of course, we appreciate all the innovations, the commitment, and all the sacrifices being done by our colleagues just to promote, to promote SRHR as a health for all and all for health. So I'll give this now to Shoba to entertain you with your questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Eden. Thank you very much. And we now have the open session. Uh, participants, please type in your comments or questions in the chat box. And those watching on Facebook can type it in the, in the comments box there. And we'll try to take up as many questions as possible. Uh, I will begin by a comment from Shabnam, who says, uh, Dr. Eden, very good to see you online. And please consider virtual conferencing or dialogue discussion tools to plug in long intervals between in-person conferences or meetings like APCR, SHR, Chen. And uh, Shabnam also says that Beth, perhaps hubs can play an important role regionally as well as globally or between regions on an ongoing basis. So, and uh, we have had a lot of comments uh, uh, praising the presentations of each of the presenters. So that's a big thank you to all of them. Too many congratulatory comments coming uh, in. Uh, we have a question from uh, Rena Donna, UNFPA Philippines. Uh, and Rena wants to know any good practice examples of innovation and financing given the changing norms around SRHR in Asia, especially in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. Any good practice examples of what? Uh, Beth and Eden like to respond to that? What's that again? Any good practice examples of innovation and financing given the changing norms around SRH in Asia and Pacific, especially in the context of COVID-19 pandemic? So, oh, well, I guess, yes. Anyway, yes. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I, would, I, I, yes, would you like? No, no, I, like I'll... I'll I'll, I'll try. I'll try to answer that later, and okay, perhaps okay. most of my we have some colleagues here from from uh, local government units, and also mm -hmm. those working with other agencies like USAID and uh, UNFPA. They're the ones who really be very much responsible for policy advocacy uh, or budget advocacy at the local level. Okay. 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 Beth, what uh, can you say something in the context of FP twenty twenty countries? Uh, any good practice examples of innovations from there in the context well, of COVID nineteen pandemic? Yes, I actually thought that um, Dr. Pramesh's presentation was the most inspiring thing I've heard lately, just in terms of bringing communities together safely, because it's in that community peer to peer and community education that we're seeing some of the most important and long lasting cultural and social changes. So with regard to access through COVID, it's you know, situational and challenging everywhere. And, and I do think we have to be realistic about donor funding as well. We're just beginning to see what the impact of that might be for, um, or of constrain, constricting economies among donors being um, going forward. And so I don't think it's going to be stronger than it's been. And we all know that it's, it hasn't exactly been a pie that's been growing over the last few years. So I do think these local contexts that bring people together for social change safely might be one of those best bets. Although the information about cell phones and how people are using those and using internet as well, I think is something that we need to understand within each context, given we're seeing such a push to use mobile technologies, but understanding how each community is using them, particularly for girls who don't have access to their own phone, much less to consistent internet access. These are really things that I think we have to continue to learn more about. Uh, there's one more question for you, Beth, that do you foresee any specific and more challenges in implementing the vision of FP 2020 beyond 2020 also due to the anti-abortion and anti-gender justice stance of some right-wing governments? Yeah, again, it's, 
it's been disheartening to see that there's been a lot of traction and a lot of coordination on the part of those who are against the SRHR agenda, against the abortion agenda. Um, but we are a strong community as well. And we are on the side of women and choice and rights. And we just have to keep pushing that forward. You know, I keep trying to tell myself even here in the United States, and we have one more week here, um, that pendulums swing both ways. And for those of us who are on the long course of this, and I know there are many colleagues here who've been working on this much, much longer than me, it's just staying that course and trying to stay strong through community. And, and for me, that was one of the big lessons of FP 2020 is how much people seem to just enjoy being together because there was this sense of solidarity, of learning what's happening in Afghanistan and the Philippines and the Solomon Islands and Pakistan, India, everybody together seeing how difficult it can be, but knowing that there is progress, it's different everywhere, but that there is hope for this agenda and for women and girls. So I just want to encourage all of us that even when it's difficult with a pandemic or with social norms that push against us, that just staying strong together can, can bring courage and, and um, progress as well. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Vishwadeepak Singh uh, for Neeta. Uh, uh, Vishwadeepak says that you mentioned in your representation that 56% users are from marginalized communities. How is this affected by gender disparities, which is one of the factors causing low uptake of contraceptives? Neeta. Um, yeah, Neeta, thank you, Shova. You and, uh, thank, yes. yes, thank you, Shova, for that question. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, I think Vishwadeep has pointed it out, uh, pointed this issue very well. Um, what I would want to say in here is when we look at the national indicators, we definitely definitely recognize that inequalities exist and it is hugely and it is hugely impacted by the social cultural norms and the patriarchal traditions as well. Women's autonomy to make decisions about their reproductive health is often extremely limited and efforts are being made, made to tap into community-based mechanisms such as female community health volunteers which I mentioned in my presentation as well in order to address myths and misconceptions related to family planning and also harmful social norms including those that uh, those which have their root in gender inequality and the pressure on married adolescent girls to begin childbearing immediately after marriage engagement of men and boys in integrated interventions linked with unfpas nepal other programming to encourage reflection on gender dy dynamics household decision making and also women's autonomy in making healthcare decisions including srh uh, including health seeking behavior for SRHR. Thank you. I hope I answered this question. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is another question for you, Nita, from Manju Karmacharya. Um, she says, uh, May I know the status of utilization of LARC by adolescents through this innovative VSP approach before and after the intervention of the project in the project supported district? The long-acting. Sure, thank uh, you. Very, yes. Thank you very much, Manjuji. Uh, she has been my ex-colleague, and uh, thank you for that question. Um, yes, regarding the utilization of uh, LARC services by adolescents, um, I didn't put it in the in the slide presentation. But when we look at the total figures, it comes to close to seven to eight percent of out of the total LARC users. And I'd just like to add in here that we are currently undertaking an operational research. Our baseline has already been conducted, end line survey is uh, awaited, and after which we will be able to get a compared uh, information on the, um, on the, on, on the use of, um, uh, user utilization of LAC services for after interventions in the project. Yeah, thank you. Thank Over to you, you. Shobha. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, there is a question from, uh, uh, Vishwadeepak Singh for Dr. Bhatnagar uh, and uh, uh, he says that uh, you said that the knowledge level among your uh, target group regarding menstruation, SRH issues was alarmingly low. Uh, could you kindly mention it in figures against the sample size? Uh, yeah, uh, is there, are they, yeah. Basically at the time of baseline survey, 
सैंपल बिकॉज इट वॉज ए मल्टी कंट्री मल्टी सेंट्रिक स्टडी सो इट वॉज ए कम्पोजिट सैंपल सो फॉर आस इट वॉज फोर डिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑफ उड़ीसा अनदर फोर सो टोटल मोर देन फोर्टी डिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑफ द कंट्री वर इन्वॉल्व सो आई वोट लाइक टू फोकस बट इन दवर उड़ीसा डिस्ट्रिक्ट इट वॉज एज लो एज सेवन परसेंट so giving exact specific sample size is slightly difficult because we got a con consolidated data in that uh, another question for you dr patnagar from rashmi uh, that violence against women and girls went up during the covid pandemic uh, any innovative steps taken to help respond to this rising sexual and other forms of gender based violence in odisha and uh, also any innovative steps taken when floods devastated parts of the state yeah first i will take over the flood part our team yes. including the peer educators they did lot of work during the flood and as someone was also asking question of financing basically mm -hmm. financing is a major major issue and concern so what we did we worked closely with the community for social mobilization and mobilization of resources and secondly what we did we advocated through the community for mobilization of government resources because what we find that getting external resources and all those things were quite okay but takes time make people dependent and government has announced lot of schemes and welfare part so we advocated with the local through local community with the government functionaries including panchayats and ensure to to mobilize and let them fulfill their commitment so that was a kind of innovation one can say and as far as violence is concerned because of so many other things as of now till now we have not come across much in our project location i am not talking in general and all i am talking in our project location we have not come across many such cases because violence against women we are addressing now for last 3 4 years so issue which was earlier there was because of lot of migrants coming back that was a major concern but like that we have not come across any appreciable or alarming rise in this case okay okay and is it an ongoing project or is it a project of a particular duration and no, have there be it's an, it's an ongoing process project supposed to end in march and at after in the month of october we were supposed to have an sort of end line survey because project has different stages the first stage was of community mobilization group formation second stage was on the capacity building third phase was on these interventions so that is why many people were asking me the specific numbers so that is why i am not able to give the specific numbers because as of now number which i have they are based only on the ongoing reporting but not based on any proper data collection and the sampling that kind of a thing so that is why i have not shared over here but because of covid i am not very sure now when this thing will happen our end line survey and all those or maybe we may come across with something different because we have pop council as our technical partner in the project so pop council will come out with a methodology and design for this end line study and when did the project begin when when did the we are, we are now in the fifth year fifth year of the project okay on okay thank you uh, we have a question from khandekar riyaz hussain uh, for mehreen uh, khandekar wants to know has the government of pakistan taken any measures to discourage people uh, from the high trend of unsafe abortions Uh, and uh, to prevent risks to women's health uh thanks shobha um uh, thanks for the question uh, so this is a very broad question but i'll try to give uh, you as much information as i can um yes uh, the government has taken many steps and i would be mentioning a few of them um a national standard and guideline has been um Uh, approved by the government of pakistan on ue pack which was technically um, assisted by ipas and it was approved in 2018 and then recently uh, sindh province has approved post abortion family planning policy it was again technically um, supported by ipas pakistan 
other than that involvement of nh w's uh, over 70% population of pakistan and implementation of ic and sp tools and intervention will help avoid unsafe approaches and i just gave a few examples of the ic and sp c tools uh, which are again endorsed by the government of pakistan and then uh, another example is inclusion of misoprostol in the national drug list um, by the government of pakistan which is a life saving drug misoprostol so these are a few examples that i could uh, name right now so yes government has taken a few very good steps but of course there's a long way to go because i just mentioned some of the statistics and and uh, the rigid society that we have and uh, the norms and the stigma that is at attached to uh, abortion and the abortion care so yeah we still have a long way to go but we are trying our best okay thank you one more question for you mehreen from vishnu yes. deepak singh that is there any documentation of the community's incorrect knowledge that your team replaced with the correct knowledge uh yes uh, as i said in the presentation we do have uh, we do uh, check the pre assessment knowledge of the community women um on abortion law danger signs fertility return and safe technologies and uh so we do have the baseline uh, data of that yes and then and then with that we check their knowledge after we train them or after the community sessions that we have with the women and then we check their correct knowledge of these things that i just mentioned thank you uh, we have a comment from shabnam uh, that eliza uh, eliza uh, eliza's and camille's presentation is very timely with the growing importance of online platforms that reach out to young people and of people of all ages but specifically to young people on sexuality issues there is reliable and unreliable correct and incorrect all kinds of information is being accessed by people even before the pandemic and during the pandemic internet became very important even outpatients gynecology and obstetrics clinics have gone virtual and we have to first register online and get the uh, covid negative test uh, uh, approved virtual consulting is not same as consulting an expert in person but this is relevant for those who have access to internet what about those who are the most marginalized and are cannot access internet so any comments on that kamin um yeah thank you thank you for uh, the comment and it's uh, it's very true uh, there's still a lot of people who don't have access to smartphone to regular internet connection etc uh, even those who do have access to smartphones uh, uh, and uh, um, air time as we saw have a non off uh, um, use pattern of use um so it is difficult what uh, what we think and i think camille can say more about that is that uh, uh, you know this is the time to get uh, the information out because of the way that uh, platforms especially such as uh, youtube work um videos that are posted uh, um uh, you know, the, what we saw when we did the search on youtube is that videos that were posted 2 uh, 3 years ago are accumulating traffic and so they will be the first um videos to appear with a search and uh, so if we put out videos with accurate actionable information now then uh, they keep on gaining uh, uh, traffic and then uh, you know 2 3 5 years down the line when even more people have uh, uh, access uh, uh, to such uh, uh, platforms uh, then uh, that information will be first rather than uh, information that might not be accurate or might be you know against uh, uh, medical abortion um, etc so uh, it's certainly not uh, a, a solution for everything but uh, it's it's a good way to get good information out now camille uh yeah i agree with um elisa and also thank you for that comment um so in msi cambodia we are maximizing different channels so may be online or offline so the online um channels is just one way for us to be able to reach um people especially young young people because they are mostly online but of course uh we do have community interventions as well we work uh with different community members 
um, with, we partner with local NGOs working with different vulnerable, vulnerable groups. Um, we provide um, training on different um, um, workers on NGO on sexual reproductive health and then ensure that they have access to safe and quality services in MSI clinics. Um, and again, it's very important that we, we as users um, look at the information that we get online because because it's easy to share information online and also the spread of misinformation is very um, apparent. So um, in MSI Cambodia, one of the things that we're also doing is um, to inform that our users really look at quality information, look at the source, uh, look at the verified information first before, you know, um, get, um, believing what they, whatever they see um, in, in the internet. So the contact center is one way for us to ensure that we we communicate with our with our um, with our clients. Um, so not just getting few information, but also there is a continuous conversation on um, questions and concerns related to sexual reproductive health. Thank you. Do you see the use of helpline numbers also, Camille? Because uh, many women have a mobile phone, but uh, very few in many countries of the Asia Pacific region have internet connection or have access to internet connection. So maybe they don't have access to these social media platforms. So can helpline numbers help them uh, a one-to-one -one talk uh, to get information? Definitely. So the contact center that we have, we do also receive phone calls. Um, so I think 99% of Cambodians have a phone. So it's not, doesn't have to be smartphones, but basic phones. So they can call us um, to the numbers that we promote. Um, and whenever we do community interventions, especially with the garment factory um, workers, we ensure that they know, we give out pocket cards with all the numbers. Um, we, we tell them, please save the number on your phones um, so that they be able to reach out to us. Um, in terms of cost, it's very um, um, affordable. And also if they don't have any um, credit on their phone, we can be able to call them back um, and then continue the conversation. Thank you. We have already overshot the time, so I would like to end here uh, with a comment from Shabir Awan, who says, equip women and girls and communities with correct information and safe pathways and improve self-use and management of abortion. So with this, we come to the close of the 10th session of APCR SHR 10 virtual. My sincere thanks to the chairperson, plenary speaker, abstract presenters, and to the participants. I would also like to thank UNFPA and IPPF for their continuous support and help to APCR SHR 10 virtual. We will now meet on Monday, November 9 at 1 p.m. Cambodia time for the 11th virtual session on the theme of people living with disabilities and sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia Pacific. Bye for now. And I also, before I say bye, I also wish you a very happy Dasera, a festival which we celebrated in India yesterday, celebrating in Nepal today, and which signifies the conquering of good over evil. And let us hope we conquer that in our lives also. So stay safe, stay healthy, and stay connected. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you everyone. all. Bye. 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 Stay.